what their illness is, what their prognosis is, but what are we planning on doing next and see if they want to talk about that. Somewhere in the conversation, and I'm encouraging not to start with the spiritual unless you know they called you. You know, they called and they wanted the Lord's Supper. They called, they wanted baptism. They called, they wanted prayer. They called, they, they're going to serve you. Okay, then you know, kind of coming. But even then, can you slow that down a little bit of how are you feeling? What's the doctors telling you? What's going on? And then lead into the spiritual, okay? And so then maybe questions of, uh, do you have a place of worship? No, I don't. I'm from out of town. What denomination are you? I'm Baptist. Would you like me to contact a Baptist pastor in town? Or would my visit be okay? Oh, you're fine. Or no, no, I would like a Baptist pastor to be called. Okay, then I've identified what they need to narrow that down. That I'm not to fulfill all those needs. Then uh, maybe, I mean, there's all kind of questions here about the spirit of what is God teaching you? What is God teaching you about this illness? Um... This, my volunteer chaplain, Nick, came up with this one. How are you and God getting along? I just love that one. It's so pleasant. It's so open-ended. And from the answer, you're going to go, well, we're not getting along very well. You know, I'm, I'm actually kind of mad at him right now. Or we're getting along great. Yeah, we talk every day. You know, you'll find out maybe someday. You pick your, don't think that my list of good questions are your list of good questions. It's, it's just a place to start, Okay. So you may go, I would never ask a question like that. I'm not asking you to. Just giving some suggestions to go with that. Then uh, do you pray? If you don't know where they are spiritually, I kind of are you a praying person? Do you pray? Would you like to pray? So it's not like I'm going to pray now. Okay? Well, what about the atheist who goes, I don't pray? What happens when I, the chaplain, leaves the room? I'll be praying for you. <laughs> I just told you I don't pray. Well, I may pray for them in secret, but I don't say, well, I'll be praying for you anyway. Yeah. Well, that's offensive. What if somebody came in like a shaman who was a chaplain, and you didn't like their kind of ritual and incantation, and said, I'm going to do one of these kind of rituals for you, you'd go, well, don't you dare. Well, that's the way it feels to those that don't pray, Okay. They're going, I don't like that kind of thing. And we're going, well, everybody got to like prayer. No, everybody don't got to like prayer. Okay? There are differences of opinion. So we kind of come in and find out where they're at in there. Are you a praying person? Yes. Would you like to pray now? No. Okay. <laughs> and then, yes, I'd like to pray. What would you like to pray about? And you're thinking, you've got this prayer already because they, you just know for sure they want to get healed of this illness and, and, you, and they're going, uh, would you pray for my kids? You don't want to pray about the cancer? Now they've told you that. No. Pray for my kids. I'm worried about them. Okay. Then you go, Lord, this cancer. You know, it's like, I said the kids. You see again, we're not listening. You know, we've got our plan. And they have a different plan. So you pray for the kids. Because it's their need, where they are at that moment. So it's all a lot of this of just listening. A lot of this chaplaincy, what we're talking about today, is learning about yourself. All this education that I had, this 1,600 hours of clinical pastoral education, that's really not a whole lot about what you do as a chaplain. It's what you are as a chaplain. Most of our hours are sitting in a group of six examining each other. <laughs> you know, kind of going, Larry, don't you know you do this every time? Now we discover this by writing out a report. What we do at the end of a visit, we go in the lobby or go in our car and we write out everything that happened during that visit. And I'm saying to you, this would be a good idea to learn. Your next time you come in the hospital and you make a visit, I want you to go down the lobby or go in your car and immediately write down everything you said, everything they said, everything you felt, everything you discovered, everything you smelt, Everything you experienced, you go, that would take a while. It was a 15-minute visit, and it will take me an hour. Uh-huh. But I want you to write that out. Then I want you to hand it to your mate. And here's what your mate's going to say. Honey, you didn't say that, did you? <laughs> well, yeah. I say it all the time. Oh, please don't. You didn't say that. They will see things that you never see. 
just like our CPE classes see things that I don't see, your mate will go, oh, please, tell me. You don't, you don't really start a conversation that way, do you? Well, yeah, all the time. Oh, honey. Or you don't end it that way. Or you don't say that in your prayer, do you? Well, yeah. Well, don't. <laughs> they see stuff, and, and you're in line theologically with your mate already, but they're going, but you just don't say that. And you go, well, I didn't notice it. You see, you went to the lobby, and you wrote it down, and you still didn't notice what you said. That's what we do in our groups. They examine us and help us grow. You see, chaplaincy is a ministry in seclusion. Nobody's watching you do it. And nobody's critiquing you. And nobody later goes, well, pastor, did you notice what you said there? In fact, I've been on you in four different pastor. You said the same thing every time. I don't think that's appropriate. No one ever gets to do that. So here's what I'm telling you with. After you've shared this with your mate, I want you to take that same handwritten and hand it to two good buddies. One buddy is going to be a very doting buddy, and everything you do is just great. The next buddy is going to be very critical, and, every, and they find a lot of stuff, okay? And both are going to help you. One's going to boost you up, and one's going to go, whoa, 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 whoa. And you will learn from that what you do in those visits. And then you examine yourself. What did I learn? Every time I'm working with my volunteer chaplain, every break time, every lunch time, I'm going, what did you learn? What did you learn about yourself? What did you learn about their theology? What did you learn about your theology? What did you learn about nursing? What did you learn about medicine? What did you learn about the hospital? What did you learn about your, your own self? What did you learn about your fears? What'd you, how did you grow today? Every time. And they love it. They go, they love to tell about their visit. So I'm encouraging you volunteer chaplains, you get together and you talk and you chew the fat and you learn from each other and you go, I had a really tough visit a month ago. Here's what happened. What would you do? They'll go, I think I would have handled it this way. No, I would have handled it this way. No, I've got an idea here. And you go, I like that one. I think I'll do that one. Now. So it's kind of this discovery of learning together. Since it's in seclusion, you're all by yourself. It may be a way that you can learn from other people. Admit that you need to grow. Uh, admit your weaknesses. Admit your feelings. And what we learn from that. Let me tell you a big blooper that I had. I've done a lot of bloopers in my days. This was, I wish I could say this was 14 years ago when I first started. It was actually about five months ago after I was teaching people to do the right thing. I was with a man in the ER who was having a heart attack and his wife was with him. And they rushed the man from the ER down to the cath lab to go up in the wire to take the blockage out to stop the heart attack. And so the wife and I was going behind the bed down the hallway, and just before they rolled the bed into the cath lab, I said to the wife, okay, kiss him goodbye. <laughs> you know, I tell chaplains all the time, don't say goodbye. And the nurse caught me and goes, see you later. And I go, I know, I know. Mm. But it slipped out. Now, thank God he did well. You know, he lived. <laughs> but those things slip out and in all of us we go why did I say that I know not to say that or someone else tells you I know we do bloopers and I know we make mistakes but I don't think it's irreparable mistakes okay I think we can learn from it we can go from it and God can use us anyway this is one of those business of on-the-job training and learning you will always learn you will always grow and I've had chaplains that after that go oh, Larry I don't think I'm suited for this business. I don't think I'll be back next Monday. I go, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay? It's a learning moment. Okay? You learn from it. It was a blooper. No, no one died because of it. But we're going to grow from it. Don't you dare think about leaving this ministry because you made a mistake. You always will make mistakes. So in part of that, I'll say grow, learn from it, um, ask good questions, and work with those. Effective listening is probably the main thing we're going to talk about today. If you go away and just learn to listen and read people, I will be happy. What I want you to do in these visits is use two ears and one mouth. Is to come in and listen. I think we're born, God created us to listen. 
with double the amount of ability than what we use. 